Um, unpeeling whiteness. You're probably trying to figure out what exactly this means, right? A Latino perspective on biblical interpretation. What this presentation is about is really about the power of racial scripts. That's what I'm about, right? And some of it stems from growing up in the U.S., and some of it is stems from my work on the southern border a little bit, the consciousness sort of thing. I don't do biblical studies in the way that's traditionally done, right? I don't do the traditional exegesis. You know, I do it something slightly different, right? I don't see myself in that light anymore. That happens in your professional career. You change over, over the years. It's not that I don't do it. I still do it. But it's, it's, I see myself much more along the lines of a cultural observer in many ways. And that's what you'll see a little bit here today. So what is a racial script? You probably wonder. A racial script is a form of communication, right? A form of communication that narrates a racialized hierarchy. A racialized hierarchy, right? With whites above, African Americans, Native Americans, Asians, Latino, Latinas, Latinx, somewhere in the middle, and it fluctuates over historical time and place, right? And so it changes. I see race as a construction. I see ethnicity as a construction as well. So it fluctuates, again, based on time and place. What is whiteness? Whiteness is a, it's not referring to people, per se. Okay, just let's be clear. I'm borrowing a little bit from Willie Jennings, uh, a Yale Divinity Professor of Theology. That's who I'm following here. There's another one also, um, Huerta, De Noche Huerta. He's a Mexican um, actor, by the way. Um, he has a really good book called Ocurio, Ocurio Prieto, right? Dark Skin Pride. It's very insightful if you, if you get a chance to, to read it in Spanish. I don't think it's translated yet in English. So I'm borrowing a little bit uh, on some of that. So whiteness, again, a way of being and seeing, right? The way of being and seeing whiteness and how it's employed within our system. So it's not really referring to a person or persons per se. Okay, I want you to get that, get that across. It's there. It's in our world, right? Whiteness is when you say, this is my land, and you take it away from indigenous people. Whiteness is when you go to another continent and steal their people and bring them to the U.S. in 1619. That is whiteness, right? And it seeps through all of our ways of thinking and being who we are. It's, it's the idea that I belong in front of the line because of my appearance, right? It says that I have these certain privileges because of who I am. Right? It says that I am above the law. It says that I can violate a woman's body and get away with it. Right? That's the ideology of whiteness. And it happens at the macro level, but it also happens in my field, theological studies. It happens in biblical interpretation at the same time. It happens not just in the US, it happens in Latin America, it happens in Asia, and it happens in Africa. So it's, it's really, it's, it's a virus that seeps through every single sectors of our, our world. That's what I'm trying to get across in some ways, right? Let me give you two more examples. June 2015, New York City, Trump Tower, he descends, that is then Donald J. Trump, and says, right, they, reference to Mexico, are sending the worst people. I'm paraphrasing, of course. They're sending their criminals, they're sending their rapists. They're not sending you, they're sending the worst. That is a racial script infused within the ideology of whiteness, which is carried on to today. Right? You can just hear the followers of that, of, of Donald J. Trump in that sense. Right? That's what I'm talking about in many ways. August, August 2017, right? Charlottesville, Virginia, on the campus of University of Virginia. Right? 
nativists march around chanting, they will not replace us. They will not replace us. And then it gets morphed. It gets morphed into what? Jews will not replace us. Jews will not replace us. That is what we call replacement theory, and that is a racial script. That is a racial script that they grabbed from another particular period of time, right? And they brought it back to the present, repackaged it, and then presented it again. And if you don't think that plays a role in theology, read the Gospel of John. Read the commentaries on the Gospel of John. Replacement theory is in the commentaries. Guess what? It's in the intro to New Testaments, right? That's why I prefer not to use that. <laughs> uh, New Testament books who use that in replacement theory. It's subtle. It's the soft, hidden things behind our feel. I want to do, what I'm interested in is, is bringing what is invisible out, to bring it visible, to bring it to the forefront. It's like taking a logo and bringing it up front, right? Taking that template and bringing it up front. That's what I'm interested. That's my project. And what you're getting today is simply a little reflection, a little snapshot of what I've been doing and where I'm beginning to develop a little bit more. That's what, that's what I'm about a little bit. I tend to be a theologian who likes to break the rules, right? right? I like to push the edges. I don't want to do what they want me to do. I want to do the things I want to do, right? I want to write my narrative, not follow theirs. So that's what I'm, that's part of it. So, so let me start this way, right? I'm trying to think of where to start. So I start with a so, the question of social location, right? Social location. Now this is, a, this is on the, a saying on the hillside in Ciudad Juarez. Okay, it says, la Biblia es la verdad, léela. The Bible is the truth, read it, right? It serves as a reminder for me today of why the importance of the Bible and biblical interpretation in the midst of immigration issues to this day, right? It serves as a reminder. This, it's, I'm a liberationist, right? That's just, I studied with Enrique Dussel, I met Gustavo Gutierrez, I, I read all that. I met a lot of the Latin American liberation theologians over my life. I got very, very lucky because of my dissertation advisor, put me in touch with a lot of these people. I'm very much interested in how do I protect the rights of the poor and the vulnerable migrants. That's, what it, that's, the un, that's a theological underpinning in everything I do. So I have to start here, right? I have to, this is my, my point of departure in, in many ways in what I, I tend to do. Not too far from here is a processing center, right? And some years ago with students, we went to the processing center and we witnessed a young boy being processed by the Border Patrol. About five foot, maybe 12, 13 years old, Dark brown hair, dark brown skin, right? Dark brown eyes, a raggedy shirt, pants, tennis shoes, right? And as we walked into that processing center, as we walked in, we caught eyes. We caught eyes. And my whole class that was surrounding me, we all caught his, caught his eyes. And we just, just dropped. We were, we, were, we were moved by, by that experience. And we, to this day, that young boy, I have no idea what happened, but that young boy haunts me to this day. And so when I'm doing this type of work, I'm remembering that boy. That boy is still in my memory. You talk about trauma, it's still there. It's still there. I wrestle with it, I tried to, to, to deal with it through my scholarship in many ways. Why, why, why migration, my immigration? Because they're human beings. Imagine if you stop saying illegals and call them Christians. Would that change the narrative? Imagine that, imagine that. Christians are evading. Let's see that on cable news. Let's see that on cable news, you see. So this is where my social location, for those who are students here, social location plays a big part in one's hermeneutical approach, or PhD students if they're here, 
right? You have to understand that social location. Of course, I'm doing very surface level material here, and it's a little bit more complex. There's other th interesting, I've met asylum seekers, um, you know, I've, I've gone to hospitality houses um, and whatnot. There's also a site near here that is a railroad. Railroads was made, were, were constructed by Asians. You have the Spanish co um, colonization of the indigenous land and so forth. You have Confederate soldiers moving here with their slaves after the Civil War. It's a very interesting spot, El Paso, Texas. And this is where you can see, you can see it from El Paso, Texas, this, this saying. So this to me has stayed with me for many, many years because again, it serves as a reminder of the work that I'm engaged in um, in my scholarship and in my, I guess I never used the word so much, but in my activist ways, I guess, in some ways. So let me tell you what I'm about to do here. So we're gonna get to the, the section proper. So what I like to do in my scholarship or in the classroom is to combine fields, right? I just don't read Johannine scholarship all day or Matthean scholarship all day. I'm actually more interested in American studies. I'm more interested in Latino studies. I'm interested in Latin American history. I'm interested in a lot of things, cultural anthropology, for example, cultural history, right? I think it, it, if you put them all together, I think it's more cultural history that, that I tend to do. And so I'm using US immigration history and combining it with biblical interpretation. Right? In some ways, it's, that's a very, if you read the preponderance of literature that I have done on, if you want to call it cultural biblical hermeneutics, you'll notice that they all begin with certain, uh, a repertoire, a tactical move that they make. And one of the tactical moves is to begin to combine it with another field. So you could do New Testament and feminist studies, New Testament or interpretation and, and let's say disability studies, ecological studies, that sort of thing, right? Um, and that's a lot of com combining of different fields. We don't simply read redaction critics, at least I don't, redaction, if you know redaction critics, redaction critic all day, right? I like to be doing something different. Like when I teach Galatians, I'm not looking at Lewis Martin's work in Galatians. I know you don't know who he is, maybe. I'm reading Frederick Douglass, I bet you know who that who is. You think Martin knows more about freedom than Douglas? Why should I be reading Martin's work when I can read refer to Douglas alongside Galatians? That's more interesting. And that's fascinating. That's the type of work I like to do, that interdisciplinary work. And so what I've done here, something's missing on the slide. Well, maybe it is, we'll see. And so what I've done here is I like to look at US immigration history primarily in the 20th century to the present to the 20th century to the present. That's what I'm doing here. That's one of the projects. I've done a lot of reading prior to it. Um, I'm picking up on some more modern, uh, more contemporary, contemporary issues. And so that's what I'm doing here in many ways. So I divide history up in three ways. I look at the closing the door, which is 24 to 65. I look at from 65 to 2001, which you'll see here soon. And I look at 2001 to, to the present. And I'm using that as an analytical lens, as an analytical lens. Now, 24 to 65, I won't go into details too much on this. Um, there's a lot of particularities behind this. But one of the things, you, it's, it's 1924, it's a Johnson-Reed Act that was passed, right? It's the Immigration Act of 1924. It is the most restrictionist period in US history, favoring Northern Europeans, not favoring Eastern or Southern Europeans, definitely not fa favoring Jewish people, right? And it's based on nativistic ideas. We are returned back to this period, I think. We have returned back to this. It's definitely fueled by eugenics. It's also part of that, right? You can go back, that's only 100 years ago. That's what's amazing. Um, but this is a restrictionist period. And one of the things is, think of, there's a racial script. I see immigration history as a racial script. It's always about exclusion. From 1790, right, with the Naturalization Act of 1790, right? From that moment on to the present, it's always about who is worthy and who is not worthy to enter into the US, right? That's what it's about, 1924. And so one of the, the racial scripts that I read, more or less, in a short way, is that we want more people that look like us. Not me, right? <laughs> White people. Right? That's the racial script. 
And every immigration policy between that period will be informed by that period, right? You can see the correlation also in biblical studies, right? But 24 to 65, more or less, right? Think of these borders, uh, think of my delineation as porous. It's not, not fixed, right? They're porous. Here is a great scholar, Raymond Brown, right? Commentary, I've read all the commentary, I've read most of his works actually, because it's my field. Um, and I'm not picking on Raymond Brown per se, I'm picking, picking on the sense that to do biblical scholarship, you had to do it like Raymond Brown and other people like Raymond Brown, you see? You couldn't get a job if you didn't do it that way. That's the hidden language behind the field, the underpinnings of the field. I have had colleagues who have lost jobs because they didn't do it the way Raymond Brown did it, right? And other scholars. Again, I'm not picking out historical criticism yet. Um, <laughs> um, but it is, it is there, right? And so that's, that's the type of correlation. And so in my paper, I tend to delineate that more, go into the nuances of what I'm trying to get across here. That's, that's what it is. You can see, if you read closely, how they saw people coming from different places. The caricature of this period, right? That's the way they communicated back then. It's, it says a lot. Another very important period that I focus on and, and go much more in depth in here, um, actually, I ended up writing more, like 35 pages. I had the editor tell me I had to cut it way back. Um, I just got into it. Um, the second historical period is, is the opening the door. The first one was closing the door. This was opening the door, but not exactly was the opening the door, right? It's the Immigration and Nation Nationality Act of 1965, also called the Heart Seller Act. The Heart Seller Act. People, people like to think of this as when the U.S. began to open up. Not exactly, not exactly. If you look at the details behind it, right? But where 24 was about nationality quotas, this is about hemispheric quotas. And so they began to open up the U.S. across the globe with a preferential option with those people with professional skills. As we began to drain Africa and Asia in particular from the intellectual class, right? We're also feeding them in uh, foreign aid at the same time, particularly in Africa. But 1970s, you can see the numbers just rise up in, um, um, fast, right? Rise up from migration from Africa in particular. Lawyers, doctors, right? These, the STEM field, right? And so what happens in, in, in many ways with this, this particular law, and there's other laws in this period, 86, IRCA, do you know IRCA, Immigration Reform and Control Act. Amnesty to those who are undocumented. 96, under Clinton, the Illegal Immigration and Immigrant uh, Responsibility Act under President Clinton, right? Those are two different acts, those are immigration reform. IRCA's amnesty under Clinton, it's a, that's when you start the enforcement of the border. It really begins to get tighter and tighter. Also because of cable news. Think of, think of culture here. Cable news is now there on the, cor on the border um, increasing the fees, I mean, fear, increasing fear of the people, not the fees, fear, they probably did that too. Uh, um, but <laughs> it will have impact in biblical interpretation. We're not immune from this. Don't think of biblical interpretation as isolated from what's happening around us, right? It's happening. This is a racial script too. A racial script is that we are okay with some people coming, some people coming to the U.S., but they have to assimilate. They have to act and behave like us, right? That's the language I hear. This is my period right here, right? That's what I heard in school, assimilation. Lose your language if you want to belong. You see the Spanish, I mean, English-only laws pop up throughout the country, right? So that's what happens here. Reading from this place, social location, is, is a alternative script to respond to this period. All of a sudden, biblical scholars are writing their own scripts. They're not gonna follow the assimilationist model. They're gonna write their own script. This is one volume, there's a second volume, reading from this place, and if you want a little interesting um, information, I was the one behind organizing this conference. This one and the second one at Vanderbilt some years ago. Remember the fax machine? I used a lot of that, that, that back then. Uh, <laughs> 
Uh, you remember that sound, right? So it's uh, for those. Um, but anyway, that's, this, is, this is your alternative script, right? This is your Gloria Gaynor in 78 saying, I will survive, right? That's what's happening, right? Michael Jackson, man in the mirror, right? That's another one. That you begin to see these self-expressions of people saying, no, 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 I'm going to take a different way. A, good, a better example would be Lin-Manuel Miranda's, Miranda's um, Hamilton. That's an alternative way of reading Hamilton, you see? And that's happening. What's happening in the culture is also happening in the field of biblical studies. You can't understand this period without also understanding the civil rights movement. Civil rights movement will have a lot to do with this. I mean, listen to, to Sam Cooke's uh, lyrics, and that will tell you a lot about this period right now. So you know I like uh, music, as you, as you can tell. Um, so anyway, that's one. And then the last one, just to get you into it, um, is the securing the door period, right? 2001 to the present. This is another period I begin to focus on a little bit. This was someone, um, I think a student um, passed this on to me. This is in Nogales, um, Arizona, Nogales, Mexico, where we took another trip to as well. And this is, it's marked by two, uh, 2001 because of the 9-11 terrorist attack on the U.S., right? It's all of a sudden the door gets secured, right? They get, there's, because of 9-11, there's a lot of reaction to border issues. 2002, you have the Department of Homeland Security established, right? 2006, under George, President George W. Bush, the Secure Fence Act. The first time they authorized 700 miles of a so-called border wall. Border barrier is probably a better term. That's what you see today when you go down to the border. It's the majority of that from that particular wall. 2012, DACA, right? The Deferred Action for Childhood Action, right? Under President um, uh, Barack Obama, right? In a reaction to some of the highest deportation records in our US history, you see? That's another period. And then, of course, we get to a more recent time with the President Donald J. Trump, right, with the Muslim travel ban in 2017, right? 2018, the zero tolerance policy, separation of children from families. 2019, migrant protoc uh, protection protocols remain in Mexico policy. The attempt to end TPS, temporary protected status. ICE enforcement. Right, public charge, and I read something recently that under his administration uh, is the most changes that we've ever had on immigration policy, with the help of, if you know his writer, Stephen Miller, one of the policy advisors within the text, within, within um, the White House at that time, right? You have to know U.S. history. You have to know U.S. history, and I would even argue that you can't understand today without understanding slavery in this country. You cannot. It is the same patterns. Yes, yes. The same pattern. They separated children from family members during slavery, and now they're doing it again. You see? And they're doing it globally, too. You see? And I try to get this across to students. That we're all connected. What happens to me happens to you. What happens to the young boy happens to you. It's all relational. Right? We can't think of them as an abstract. They are human beings, right? That's my theological principle as well. Everyone is made in the image of God. I play with that a lot. A counterscript, a counterscript is what you're seeing today, right? This is a counterscript that my, my dissertation advisor and I have co-edited recently, right? But there's other counterscripts, right? The work that Dr. Thomas is doing is a counter, counterscript. The doctor that, that Dr. McNich is doing is a counterscript. The work that Amy is doing with Dr. Allen is doing with children is a counterscript. The work that Dr. Robertson and Dr. Bugs and Dr. Davis are counterscripts. Dr. Peterson, that's all counterscripts. Black Lives Matter is a counterscript. You see? And the, so, those young people who are marching in the streets of Dallas and New York and everything, protesting some of the immigration policy, those are counterscripts. We at CTS is about counterscripts, right? You want to know what liberal progressive theology is? That's it. 
That's a speck, speck among many other things about that, right? You just have to listen to Los, Tig Los Tigres del Norte, listen to their lyrics. That's a counterscript. Ruben Blades, a counterscript. Beyonce Formation, a counterscript. Taylor Swift, Shake It Off, a counterscript. You see, it's everywhere, but we need everyone to do that. We cannot do it alone. Otherwise, those young kids who are being separated from their families to this day will be, continue to be so. We have, we need counter narratives in our lives, right? We all need to be part of it. And so what I used to tell students, jump on the train. Jump on the train, let's take us somewhere together. That's what, that's what my project is all about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.